church. It is a gospel, though, that has always had a certain amount of confusion because it's so different from the other three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the synoptics. Uh, Eusebius, for example, in his Ecclesiastical Histories, uh, abbreviated uh, HE3, H -E in Ecclesiastical Book 3, uh, Chapter 39, states that Papias noted that where it is proper to observe the name John is twice mentioned, the former he mentions with Peter and James and Matthew and the other apostles, evidently meaning the evangelist, but in a separate point in his discourse, he ranks the other John with the rest, not included in the number of the apostles. Placing Aristion before him, he distinguishes him plainly by the name of the presbyter or the elder. Unfortunately, uh, Papias' account is lost, but he is, you notice a certain confusion. Who is this John who wrote the gospel? Is he John the apostle, or is he John the presbyter or the elder? Some scholars, especially English scholars, have seen this passage as evidence of more than one John in Ephesus, the apostle and the elder. In addition, we see that John wrote a more spiritual gospel. Eusebius also quotes Clement of Alexandria, stating that uh, John, last of all, perceiving that what had reference to the body of our Savior was sufficiently detailed, and being encouraged by his familiar friends and urged by the Spirit, he wrote a spiritual gospel. Uh, for support of this, we can look at John uh, 21. 25, um, John 21, 25, where he specifically states he does not write everything that he knows about. Twenty-one, twenty-four, twenty-five. Uh, uh, 25, but there are many other things which Jesus did, which, if were written, each one, kathen, each every one, uh, I do not uh, think that the world itself could contain the books. In other words, that he is being selective. What does this tradition tell us? It tells us that John is the last gospel to be written, that there are real differences between John and the synoptics. This was a problem uh, for the early church, especially since the uh, first commentary on John was written not by a person within the quote-unquote orthodox or Catholic tradition, but by the Gnostic Heraclion around 145. Is this evidence, for example, of a split within the Johannine community? Now, the authorship was traditionally uh, affirmed, uh, asserted to be John, the son of Zebedee. This was affirmed by the Muratorian canon, as well as by Eusebius, but there are challenges to this tradition. We have already noted that there's a confusion within the tradition itself. Was this John, the son of Zebedee? Was it John the Elder? Evidence, there's also some evidence of an early martyrdom of John, son of Zebedee, although this tradition is actually quite late. Also, we cannot necessarily say that John, the Gospel, and the letters of John, and the book of Revelation are written by the same person. The book of Revelation only speaks of a uh, prophet named John having written them. In fact, the grammar is so different that many scholars, in fact, the majority of critical scholars, would discount a tradition of common authorship between John and the uh, book of Revelation. So there are challenges to traditional authorship. For example, in, when there is a, appears to be an eyewitness account, such as in John 18.15, the uh, uh, it is in the third person. Also, this is particularly in 1935. This is the disciple who has witnessed to you. 
and John 18, 15, there is another disciple who is mentioned as a person who is known to the high priest. This is how John, Peter and the other disciple gain entrance into the uh, uh, courtyard during Jesus' trial. Is it likely that the high priest would be known to a Galilean fisherman? Now, there have been ways that people have sought to get around this, that John's family, because Zebedee obviously had uh, employees, he obviously uh, was more upper class, he, and this was the person that the high priest bought his fish from. Well, first of all, the high priest undoubtedly would never have gone to in person to buy his fish. That's what you have servants for. Finally, in John 21, 20 to 24, it implies that the beloved disciple has already passed away, as we can see when we read John um, 21, 20 to 24. And Peter turning saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, following who, um, whom he rested in the uh, uh, upon the uh, chest during the uh, the dinner. Seeing, Peter, seeing this one, said to Jesus, "Lord, why do this one?" And Jesus said to him, "If I wish him to remain until I come, what is that to you? What pros, pros, to pros, sa, What to you is what it literally says. You follow me." Therefore, the word went out to the uh, disciples, to the brothers and sisters, that this mis that, disi that disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I wish him to remain until I come, what is that to you? The uh, note here is that it almost sounds like there's an explanation why Jesus' words did not come true, that disciple has in fact passed away. Also, the role of the 12 in the Gospel of John, aside from 667, you hardly ever hear of them, and they play very little role in John. It requires some very good evidence to discount early tradition. There seems to be that good evidence that John comes not from the son of Zebedee, but derives from the community of the beloved disciple, from somebody who was a close follower of Jesus, probably located in Jerusalem, but was not one of the twelve. Why do we say this? Well, Raymond Brown has a number of has discussed the uh, his theory about the development of the uh, Johannine community in various phases. You see this in your reading of. Brown, in the um, introduction to the uh, that you are reading, you will notice that the he has simplified his uh, 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 outline of the history of the Johannine community into about three phases, rather than the original five phases, which he came to consider in light of various criticisms that this was far too. Uh, complex and could not be uh, asserted with as much confidence as he would like. Phase one, you have the original group with what's called a low Christology. At this stage, John the Baptist is important. Note the importance of John the Baptist in um, John 1 and 3. And the original founder was probably an ex-disciple of John the Baptist and a follower of Jesus. This community forms in Jerusalem. In phase two, the gospel is written after the admission of Samaritan Christians who have an anti-temple bias. The community takes a stronger stand against crypto-Christians who are still part of the synagogue, and the distinction between followers of Jesus and the Jews is developed. By this time, the community has moved to Asia Minor, maybe Ephesus. Phase three, the letters are written, the community begins to have internal divisions. Divisions grow out of the interpretation of John's gospel. At least two groups can be determined from the letters, those who remained in the community and those who left. After the letters, 
of the group that remain joins the greater church and forms part of the Catholic, uh, the Church Catholic. The secessionists leave and become part of the growing Gnosis movement. The gospel itself is written in phase two. You can see more detail about this in Brown and Maloney in the introduction. Martin Hingle, in his book, The Johannine Question, has a simpler analysis. A follower of Jesus, who is, is behind the gospel, if he died around 100, was probably born around 15, and was a member of a priestly, priestly aristocracy likely named John. He, he, the bride was likely named John. Incidentally, notice the importance of Jerusalem, notice the importance of the high, the priestly aristocracy, notice the meetings in, uh, for example, in John 7, in John 11, where you have the internal, uh, uh, and John 12, where you have the internal uh, 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 discussions among the high priests, among the Sanhedrin. How would the author know that? Possibly because he was a member of that group. The revival movement, anyway, of John the Baptist probably appealed to this individual. Already in contact with Jesus, he witnessed Jesus' fate in Jerusalem, this, this John being still quite young. He belonged to a wider group of adherents, perhaps associated with the sons of Zebedee. In this 10th situation in the 50s and 60s, he left Jerusalem and founded his school, which flourished 35 years later. During his stay, he was exiled to Patmos, and thus we see that the author uh, or inspiration for both the Gospel and the Epistle of John, as well as Revelation, uh, is the same individual. This is a position which, as I said, rather few scholars would agree today, but is still one that Hingle asserts. As the authority of the, uh, the this individual uh, grew, he survived the apostles and later was regarded as the old man of the church. In his very original theological work, uh, Jewish-Palestinian reminiscences are combined with a Hellenistic, enthusiastic, uh, fanatical, even Pauline elements, and the result is a great synthesis. Later, 200 years later, uh, he was identified with John, the son of Zebedee. These are two very different uh, analyses. There are many others. Note, however, that both of them have something in common. They note that there is a community that forms around Jesus. It does not simply include the uh, 12, but includes an individual who was also, uh, uh, how should we put this, he who was also um, uh, uh, associated with the Jerusalem uh, uh, community, a community that is separate from the Galilean community. And it is the Jerusalem community that is responsible for the Gospel of John. There's also the question of whether John, in fact, does use synoptic traditions. So as we, we discuss whether John is dependent on synoptic traditions, we can see that uh, if he does, he reworks them. For example, if you look at John 6, the feeding of the 5,000, there are um, numerous differences. Uh, not only is there the story of the young boy who uh, provides the fish and the uh, uh, loaves, there's the effort to make Jesus king. It is seen as a sign by the people. Also, it becomes a very, um, uh, uh, how should we put this, a, 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 a starting off point for the later Bread of Life discourse. Um, there are very significant differences in the passion narrative. Uh, Jesus has a much more uh, robust discussion with Pilate. He also uh, is never kissed by uh, Judas. Uh, Jesus is always in control. There is no scene of Gethsemane in the uh, Gospel of John. So what are some of the alternatives to authorship by John. As we've already talked about, we've talked about um, some of the uh, uh, theories by Hingle and by Brown. 
In the late 19th and early 20th century, though, it was thought that John was late. Indeed, late second century was one of the uh, theories about the authorship of the Gospel of John. However, the arguments of um, for uh, are, uh, and the arguments for um, late authorship were uh, the contrast between light and darkness said to reflect Gnostic thought. You still see this in Boltmann's commentary, even though uh, he doesn't accept such a late uh, authorship. Uh, the geography is said to have been um, quite uh, uh, inaccurate. There were a number of things that, such as Bethany and the Pool of Bethesda, etc., that were said to not be confirmed by archaeology. However, the arguments against late authorship have emerged as we just learned more about the world of Palestinian Judaism. For example, there is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the um, fact that light versus darkness imagery is not unique to the Gospel of John. It is found also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is in fact a very um, Jewish tradition within uh, first century Palestine. Incidentally, a number of uh, authors have recently suggested that the uh, Essene community originated out of the priestly community of um, of uh, Jerusalem. If that's the case, we have another connection between this kind of language and the uh, life of uh, uh, of Jesus. There's the discoveries around Jerusalem, such as the Pool of Bethsaida or uh, the uh, Pool of Bethesda. If you look at uh, Joachim Yeremias, the rediscovery of Bethesda. See also uh, some of the work by John P. Meyer and a marginal Jew discussing how that the Gospel of John, more than any other place in the New Testament, has the most accurate descriptions of the area in and around Jerusalem. Also, there was a discovery of P52, which has 18 lines of John, and was dated to about uh, 100 to 150. Some recent scholars, though, have debated this, and some have tried to date the um, fragment as late as the 4th century, so this argument is not as strong as it formerly was. So then, ultimately, who wrote John? Was it John the Apostle, John the uh, uh, Elder, or Martin Hingle's alternative? A follower of John, who is the uh, son of Zebedee, who might be responsible for the gospel. The relationship uh, to the phases of the gospel and epistles are that the author of the epistle seems to save the gospel to the for the church and provides the acceptance of Johannine Christology by mainstream Christians. Traditions found in the Gospel of John go back to some original associate of Jesus. This is something we can conclude. The person was likely not John, the son of Zebedee. Although note Goodacre, when, he, when you hear his podcast, who was the beloved disciple, who argues that the Gospel of John allows for the reader to conclude that the author was John, son of Zebedee. He for our purposes, we can see that the composition of John occurs in the context of a Johannine community, whatever that means, and the gospel likely goes through one or more editions, as we see in John 21, uh, written probably as an appendix to the gospel, which is evidence to the fact that it probably was written in its various phases. There are also some textual dislocations within the gospel of John that are seen as signs of an editing process not always uh, uh, carried through with, uh, with exactitude, although I personally am not as convinced about the uh, problems with the uh, editing as some are, just because something doesn't follow necessarily our concepts of chronology and our obsession with uh, space and time does not mean that it was does not have a rhetorical uh, connection or purpose replacement. In the ancient world, for example, you would remind people of what went on before because everything was oral. So you don't have the uh, uh, ability to go back and forth as uh, we do today. 
literary characteristics, if you look at Thompson on page 16 for her outline, she gives uh, uh, a more detailed outline than we have here. But here is just a simple outline of, of the Gospel of John. You have a prologue, 1, 1 to 15, or 1, 1 to 18. Um, there's a, I tend to prefer actually 1, 1 to 18. There's the Book of Signs, which is one either 1, 16 to 12, 50, or 1, uh, 19 to 1250. The Book of Glory, which appears, in, which is basically Jesus' last uh, days in Jerusalem. In fact, from 13, 1 to 20, 31 is basically his last two days of his life. And then you have the appendix of chapter 21. So whether the first 15 or 18 verses constitute the prologue has been disputed. Whatever the case, John 1, 1 to 15, or 1, 1 to 18, certainly introduced the major themes of the gospel. If it is not a prologue, it is an introduction, perhaps something similar to the introduction of prophetic books like Ezekiel 1 or Isaiah 6, where you learn about who the prophet is. Here you learn about who the person that's going to be discussed is, who is the word, the logos, who is also the light and the truth. There are characteristics of the Book of Signs. Is it based on a source, or a sign, or a sign often a sign often introduces some form of dispute, as we see in five, six, and nine. Um, so you have a sign, or a sign which is also introduction to a dispute. Not all signs introduce this dispute. The turning of the water into wine does not, but other signs do. There is also uh, the fact that Jesus is not only revealed through signs, but also through discourses, as in chapter 4, the long discourse of chapter 7 to 8, and chapter 10. Jesus was revealed in this uh, section both in word and in deed. In regards to the book of glory, the passion and death is where Jesus glorifies God, as we see in 1229. This theme is made clear in the discourse from 14 to 17. The betrayal in 4, 18, 2 to 14 is portrayed, as we said earlier, very differently from the synoptics. Judas does not kiss Jesus. The disciples do not flee, but are rescued. And Jesus maintains control even as a prisoner. And even during the interrogation of Pilate, in fact, in uh, chapter 18, the, uh, it, when Jesus is interrogated by Pilate, Sometimes you don't know who the uh, interrogator is. Is it Pilate or is it Jesus? There are ironies and double meanings. For example, when Jesus says born again, does he mean born again or born from above? We'll discuss this later. There is living water. The woman at the well wants water, but the, he is, but Jesus is the living water. He is the bread from heaven. Um, the people who want literal bread but Jesus speaks of spiritual bread. In 11.23, your brother will be raised. The, um, Martha says, yes, she'll be, he'll be raised at the last day. But Jesus becomes the resurrection and the life, and the one who believes in him will never die. He will never experience spiritual death. There's the unwitting prophecy of the high priest in 11.50. He says it's best for one to uh, die rather than for... Uh, the nation to be destroyed. He doesn't understand that he's speaking a prophecy. In each case, the double meaning leads to an explanation, either by Jesus or by the uh, author of John. There are figures of speech. There is a figure of light as compared to darkness, this bread of life. There are figurative stories or metaphors rather than parables, the good shepherd and 10, one to six, and the vine in 15, 1 to 8. Jesus re disciples refer to how Jesus speaks in figures of speech and, uh, or metaphors in John 16, 25, but then say that Jesus speaks clearly, although they never do understand what he's saying. Like the signs of figures of speech or metaphors lead to further discussion. This discussion explains Jesus' ministry, person, and destiny, usually which is hidden from the disciples themselves because they fail to understand who Jesus is. 
Also, Jesus is very forward about his identity. Unlike the synoptics, most of Jesus' activities occur in and around Jerusalem. And Jesus' opposition is more spelled out. In the synoptic gospels, although in uh, Mark 3, 6, you begin to see the opposition to Jesus begin, uh, uh, developing among the Pharisees and the Herodians, nevertheless, in, in uh, 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 the Gospel of John, you have m more uh, incidents of the council meeting together and describing what's the, what are they going to do with this Jesus. We don't want this, if he, if he keeps, uh, uh, if we don't do something, he's going to, the Romans are going to come and destroy our temple, for example. Not realizing that with the, the rejection of Jesus, the Romans came and destroyed the temple in 66 to 70. Um, there are also textual difficulties. Um, five four, there is that verse about the angel coming down to uh, um, stir up the waters. That is not found in all texts. In seven uh, fifty three to eight eleven, that says eight here it should be eight eleven. Uh, eight eleven, the woman taken in adultery. That uh, is not found in many manuscripts. And some people question about John twenty one. The final appearance of Jesus was that part of the gospel, or was it a later appendix? That one's a little bit harder to uh, identify because there's no manuscript evidence that it was that the Gospel of John ever circulated without John 21. Uh, in fact, uh, there have been um, some who have tried to argue that there are enough commonalities between John 21 and the rest of the gospel to say that it was actually written at the uh, as the original uh, conclusion. Other scholars disagree. That one we can hold to later, later. There are seven I am statements also where the term I am appears um, with a predicate nominative. That is, that there, there's a predicate that describes what this means. It's I am and then what am I? The bread of life. That's the predicate. Subject and predicate. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light and the, the way, the, law, the, way the truth and the, law, uh, and the light. And I am the vine. No, in fact, um, we can see that here is where we have an understanding of what John means with I am. Uh, you'll see in Thompson, as, she, as you read her uh, excursus on the I am sayings, that I am can be simply a way of saying it's me. Uh, uh, it can be an ego and me can be simply a, a way of uh, expressing it is I. But because of these I am statements, we see that <clears throat> when John uses this term, it has a more significant meaning, going back to Exodus 3, I am that I am. This is a key found particularly in 620, when Jesus self-identifies I am when walking on the water. All the Gospels have that phrase. But remember, in the Old Testament, for example, in, Genesis, in Psalm 29, who walks on the water? It's God. The fact that Jesus walks on the water doing something that is a specifically divine activity means that in all of these Gospels, we can see this as an identification of Jesus' incarnation, which is especially evident in um, the Gospel of John. In John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the fact that uh, his opponents pick up stones to... to uh, to uh, execute Jesus s indicates that they see this as a statement of blasphemy. So with the exception of the walking on the water, the I am statements are revelatory statements. And I would say even that one is a revelatory statement in the context of, uh, of the, the event of walking on water because of who, what that symbolizes. This feature then is most apparent in 858 where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. I am, meaning not I was, but I am. I was then, I am now. That is a statement of Jesus' 
uh, incarnation. The seven I am statements, unlike 858, are directed either to Jesus' disciples or to those sympathetic to his message, whereas the one in 858 is specifically addressed to his opponents. With regard to the signs, they also bear witness to Jesus. In 1410 and 11 and 1524, we see the, the uh, theology or purposes of the signs. Let's look at 1410, for example. Do not believe that I am the Father, <coughs> Father in me. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am the fa in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. On the on account of the works themselves, uh, ta erga auta. In 1524, if I had not done among them works which no one else did, they would have no sin. Notice that they have their sin is because they have not believed in Jesus' works. Also, there is the proclamation of eternal life. Unlike the synoptics, the focus of John is not the kingdom of God, a phrase which is very seldom used in the Gospel of John, except for, say, in chapter 3 and 3, verses 3 and 5. And even when the kingdom of God is used, it's used in a different context. It's used to refer to the eternal life of the believer rather than the apocalyptic action of God at the work of Jesus' his ministry, as we see in 3.15 to 16. Um, Jesus, the focus of John's gospel is on forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Although it could be argued that eternal life itself is an apocalyptic notion and forgiveness of sin is an quote-unquote apocalyptic notion. John's use of Ezekiel throughout the uh, gospel tends to indicate that he is much more in tune with a proto-apocalyptic or apocalyptic mentality than is sometimes recognized. Nevertheless, eternal life is also used in the absolute to refer to spiritual life. But has John replaced the more apocalyptic eschatology with what we call a realized eschatology? Again, I mentioned that he uh, utilizes Ezekiel in some important places. So is there something else at work? Is there a redefinition of apocalyptic? Also, some four and a half chapters of the Book of Glory are concerned with Jesus' last discourse. The major themes are the disciples will seek Jesus, but will not find him, as we see in 3, 1333, but also see also in 734. The disciples are to love one another in 13, uh, 33 and 34, 14, 15, and 15, 12 to 13. In fact, some people have said that the Gospel of John's concept of love is not the same as that of the synoptics. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, where they love the uh, enemy, but is directed towards an internal uh, compassion towards uh, loving one another. In 14.1, the disciples are not to be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The role of the Holy Spirit, or advocate, is found in 14.16 to 17. 15, 26 to 27, 16, 7, and 16, 12, and 14. The Spirit is also mentioned in the Book of Signs as well. However, in the farewell speech, the activity of the Holy Spirit is defined in detail. The Holy Spirit is a paraclete, the advocate, the one called alongside to help or convict. The King James uses the term comforter, but the language changed between the 17th and 18th century. Comfort to us makes, makes someone who makes you feel good. That's not what it meant in the 17th century. It meant more of an advocate. The paraclete, in the paraclete passages, the Holy Spirit takes on a personality. While the synoptics or Paul, the Holy Spirit may be used in the Old Testament sense as the dynamic presence of God or of Jesus. 
In John, this understanding is not what we find. Rather, we find something closer to what would later become the Nicene or Chalcedonian Orthodoxy, the Holy Spirit as one of the persons of God, although we cannot say that we have a full-blown Trinitarian theology in the Gospel of John. So, the Gospel of John has a very different feel than the Synoptics. There are signs, but no exorcisms. There are long discourses. Jesus' ministry is primarily located in Jerusalem, and John's outline follows the Jewish feasts. In the synoptics, Jesus' ministry likely covers a year to 18 months. In John, it covers a minimum of three years. Yet the Gospel of John also contains the most accurate information we have in the New Testament of the geography of Jerusalem and its environment. Thus, we can have confidence that it relies on good ancient tradition, but tradition different from that underlying the Synoptic Gospels. John, did, did John write within a unique community, a community of a beloved disciple, as was Raymond Brown's conclusion? This has been backed by some other scholars. Richard Balcom, on the other hand, says that John was written for all Christians and not a specific community. He seeks to correct the John seeks to correct the portrayal of Jesus found in the Synoptics. He provides a message for the church as a whole. Thus, the idea that John is to be interpreted on on, uh, on two levels, as we, we will discuss in chapter nine, is not correct. Which position is correct? The debate continues. John is unique among the Gospels also, and it does not uh, begin with the initiation of Jesus' ministry, nor does it begin with an account of Jesus' birth. It begins in primordial time, as we see as we discuss John 1. It begins with reminding the reader of Genesis 1, in the beginning. And for many of us, um, when we take Greek, the first thing we actually memorize is John 1 1. In our K in Halagas, Kai Halagas and Prostanta on Kai Thaas in Halagas. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So in the beginning was the Word. What does Logos mean? What is this mysterious word, or more accurately, the reasoning principle, which is distinct from a Rhema? which is word of speech, although John, we must admit, sometimes uses them interchangeably. Is this a Hellenistic or Jewish concept, or both? And the TD&T, uh, Kleinecht, uh, uh, notes that the, the Hellenistic law of speculation, uh, notes Hellenistic law of speculation as being an important feature within the New Testament uh, presentation. He needs, notes the presence of the term in Neoplatonism and Stoicism, and Plutarch uses this term, as does Philo of Alexandria. Yet as Frosch notes in the same article, from pages 91 to 100, the concept is very much at home in the Hebrew Bible, where we see the importance of the Word of God. There are two words in the Septuagint, or the, uh, the uh, translate, or two Hebrew words, translated by the Septuagint for, by the word logos. The Hebrew words are davar and amar. These are the two words translated by the Septuagint uh, translators in as the term logos. The first davar is the material concept with its energy felt so vitally in the verbal contact that the word appears as a material force. This imagery is found in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 where it takes visual dimensions. It's also found in Amos 7 as an expression of God's verbal communication. Wisdom speculation also developed themes, as we see of, uh, in Proverbs 3.19, and developed the idea that wisdom became almost a companion of God. The term logos also has two other connotations in Jewish thought, as Kenyon knows very well. These are wisdom and Torah. Wisdom descended from heaven, as we see in Baruch uh, uh, 39, 339, 29 to 30. 
is the object of God's love in Wisdom 8.3 and sits on God's throne, as we see in Wisdom 9.4. In Wisdom 10, we see wisdom personified, uh, punishing and protecting uh, uh, believers. It's a punishing and protecting power, a manifestation of God's uh, um, uh, authority. Yet, John 1.1 1, 1 speaks of Jesus as being the pre-existent Logos, not wisdom, not Sophia. Why is this done? In part, you can find a combination of wisdom and Torah in writings such as Syriac 15.1 and in 1920 and in 39.1. In Syriac 15.1, for example, we see the following. Whoever fears God will do this, and whoever holds to the law will obtain wisdom. The law is the source of wisdom. In 2423, uh, uh, we end also in 34.8 and 39.1, we see that the two can be identified. In 2423, All this is the book of the covenant of the Most High, the law of Moses, that Moses commanded us, and the inheritance for the congregation. It overflows, as in 25, like the Pishon with wisdom, and the Tigris at the time of fruits. It runs over the Euphrates with understanding, and the Jordan at harvest time. It pours forth instruction, like the Nile, like the Gihon at the time of vintage, and Then the first man did not know wisdom fully, nor the last one fathom her, for her, her thoughts are more abundant than the sea, and her counsel deeper than the abyss. This is uh, 24, uh, 23 through 29. So wisdom is seen as also a manifestation of God's words. The first human being did not understand it. He did not have Torah. And the last man will not understand Torah either because it is um, eternal. As the eternal, as the so as Jesus was eternal, or the eternal logos, so was uh, Jerusalem. So was the Torah personified in uh, Judaism. So that Torah was God's word and wisdom naturally coalesced in popular wisdom thought, including that of the sort, the sages, who carried the identification into the emerging rabbinic movement, for whose views we have ample existing data. John's praise of the word is ultimately a contrast to the limitations of the Mosaic law, as we see in John 1.17. Jesus is the embodiment of all God's character revealed in the Mosaic law, but more accessible to humanity. This is in Keener in his commentary on John, volume one, page 361. John's use of logos then was a brilliant concept. Uh, it was, was brilliant. No concept better articulated an entity that was both divine yet distinct from the Father. The logos then was both with God and was God. Now there's been some debate about the phrase was God since the term theos in the predicate part of the sentence has no article. However, according to Caldwell's laws of the predicate nominative, the predicate does not take an article, and thus, even without an article, can be understood as, a, uh, uh, as definite rather than indefinite. Thus, to make the subject clear, the predicate has no article, but is clearly specific. The word was God. In John 1, we do not have a fully developed Nicene Christology, yet we have an expression of what Larry Hurtado would call a binatarian Christology. James D.G. Dunn uh, points to the Johannine Christology as the one expression of Son of God Christology in the New Testament. I think personally he goes too far. 
But with Philippians 2, 5 to 11, uh, and 1 John and Hebrews and Revelation, we see one of the most developed Christologies of the New Testament. In 1, 2, and 3, we see the primordial role of the Son. He was in the beginning with God. As wisdom in Sirach 24, 1 to 8, the Son participated in creation. All things were made by or in him. All of them. Likewise, he dealt uh, with the most high and alone. Likewise, uh, as without him was not anything made that was made. And likewise, as wisdom, he dealt with the most high. And alone, I composed the vault of heaven, as we see in um, Proverbs 24.5, yet, or in um, Sirach 24.5, yet um, in John, this is Jesus. So yet there's a very significant difference between the word and wisdom. In Sirach 1.4, the word was created. In uh, our wisdom was created. In John, the word not only was with God, but was God. So, as wisdom, who uh, created all things, uh, and was also with God from the beginning, so is Jesus, but he is superior to wisdom. The fact that the word was with was God prepares the reader for the I am statements of the God uh, of uh, of Jesus later on that he is in fact uh, the inc incarnation of God. The only verb that can be that can describe God is to be or is. God is because God is eternal. So Jesus shares God's character. He is as the word. Jesus is the creator through whom and by whom all things are made. The word or the reason of God shares God's nature, but truly becomes flesh, truly becomes incarnate. In verses 4 and 5, the word is characterized by both light and life. Again, we have two terms that will characterize the Gospel of John. Jesus' life, whose role is in the resurrection is made clear in chapter 5, also in chapter 11 with the resurrection of Lazarus. He is the resurrection and the life in 11.25. He is also the source of all light, which enlightens all people, as we see in 1.5. You can see this also developed in 3.19-21. In an earlier age, light versus darkness contrast was understood as a reflection of Hellenistic, even Gnostic background to the Gospel of John. Uh, Boltmann makes a big point of this, for example. Hellenistic Judaism, such as Philo, was also seen as a source of the imagery. But with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially the War Scroll, the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness, and the Community Rule, we have found that the language is also at home in Palestinian Judaism. This is not just Hellenistic language, this is Jewish language. It appeals to both audiences. In 1.6-9, the role of the Baptist is introduced. It's interesting that John is never called the Baptist or baptizer in John. Rather, he's a witness to the light. He is the one sent by God to bear witness to that light. And the goal of the witness is that all should believe in the light. Incidentally, the notion of light became very important in uh, later medieval theology. Hildegard of Bingen made a big point of the light in a lot of her writings. In 913, the role and mission of the word, is all, also known as the light, is further divided. He is, in, he is the true light. He came into the world, which was made by him. And notice the irony here. The world knew his not. He came to his own. They did not know him. So to understand who Jesus is, to understand who the word is, the light is, requires divine revelation. In 113, there's this contrast. As many as received him, received the exousia to become God's children. The reason believers can become children of God is because their authority to become God's children presumably emphasizes divine authorization to become what no human effort could accomplish. Keener further notes that the authority is 
that authority is emphasized in 527, 1018, 17.2, and 19.10 and 11. The authority is not according to the flesh, according to 3.6, not from human sources. Rather, it's 1.14, we should see that the, it's from the, the, the authority is because the Logos was incarnate. The Logos became flesh and tabernacled among us. Notice the language of tabernacling, which is literally what is, is uh, uh, said here. Uh, we, we often miss this in the English. Eskenosin among us. He's dealt in the tent among us. As the glory of God dwelled on the tabernacle, as we see in Exodus 40, 34 to 35, so Jesus was the expression of God's glory. But it's also a glory, that glory uh, is seen in 114, Jesus is the expression of the glory. And we saw his glory. Visions of God's glory are also found in Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 to 3. Indeed, in Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, these uh, form the background of John the Seer's vision in Revelation 4. 4. Now, I'm not saying Revelation and the Gospel of John were written by the same person or the same community, only that we have evidence of a meditation on God's throne among the Christian communities in Asia Minor. Meditation on the divine throne also became a theme of apocalyptic and Merkava mysticism, Merkava referring to the divine throne chariot of Ezekiel 1, as we see in Ithamar Grunwald's work, Apocalyptic and Merkava mysticism. Now, instead of being of the divine throne, it is uh, it's, uh, focused on Jesus himself. As Ezekiel saw visions of, of God's glory, so Jesus' disciples beheld the glory of God in the person of the incarnate Logos. In this regard, the revelation of God's glory to be to mere flesh and blood at any time can cause a sensory overload. For example, seeing the glory of Yahweh caused Ezekiel to be dumbfounded for seven days. The comparison suggests that one only can handle the topic of revelation of Jesus, Yahweh's glory, without handling the glory, without handling that one cannot handle the topics of uh, the revelation of Jesus or Yahweh's glory without handling the effects it has on the senses. In other words, you, if you perceive Jesus' glory or God's glory, you will have, it will impact your uh, whole being one way or the other. The witness of Jesus is far greater than John's. Jesus bore witness concerning the light and also mentioned the light's preeminence. We, on the other hand, have received the light as we see in 116 and compared with 1 John 1, 1 to 5. This witness is greater than the witness of Moses. From Moses came the law, but grace is from Jesus. The Logos is none other than the firstborn son of God. Note the importance of the term firstborn in 118. Similar language refers to Isaac in Genesis. Jesus is from the very boss bosom of the father the Kalpas, indicating a close association. Moses was God's friend, but he does not share the nature of God. The Logos does. In 119 to 28, we see John's witness. John's ministry is defined less as a baptism uh, in John 1 and more as witness. It is not defined that um, denied that John is not denied that John baptizes. In fact, in three. 25 to 43, there's a specific mention of it. However, in this gospel, John's primarily significance is as a witness to Jesus. In response to questions by those sent from the Jews, first in reference to the Jews here, in Jerusalem in 120, John denies that he's either the Messiah, Elijah, or the prophet of uh, Deuteronomy uh, uh, 8, 15 to 22. Unlike the synoptics, particularly Matthew, in Matthew 17, 9 to 13, John is not referred to as Elijah. Is this an attempt to diminish John's role? 
This is what some scholars say, that because of the close association that John has, and the fact that John's movement and the Jesus movement at one time were actually in competition with each other, John, and in fact all the gospel writers, attempt to diminish John's role. If it is, the Gospel of John does this in a very strange way, because it is the only Gospel to mention that Jesus' ministry overlapped John's, and that John was originally a disciple of, or that Jesus was originally a disciple of John, as discussed by Meyer in his work at Apocalypse and a Marginal Jew. In 119 to 51, we see Jesus' first disciples. On that day, John sees Jesus. He proclaims the Lamb of God, the one who takes away the world's sin. Now, this is a unique title for Jesus in the Gospel. Now, the sin offerings were usually either goats on Yom Kippur or bulls, not lambs. Lambs were offered at Passover, but not as a sin offering. Rather, so is Jesus a new Passover? Is, is this a reference to Isaiah 53? So that Jesus, rather than the nation of Israel, is a suffering servant? Many scholars see the reference to be, as to be that of the latter. The reason Jesus, John can be so sure that Jesus is the Lamb of God is his testimony that he saw the Spirit descending upon Jesus. It was God's own testimony that this is the one God sent to baptize in the Spirit. In 135 to 43, John again bears witness to Jesus and sends some of his disciples after Jesus. In 136, Jesus is again the Lamb, the Omnus of God. Now, the title of Omnus is unique to John's Gospel. Jesus is the Lamb of Revelation, but there is the Arnia, which can either mean little lamb or ram. This, incidentally, is also the title for Jesus' sheep in uh, John 21, which is one reason that some people think that John 21 is actually an appendix written by another author. But it's interesting. Jesus is the Omnus but Jesus' flock are the Arnia. Just something to keep in mind. Maybe there's a reason why different terms are used. In 138, Jesus asks, what do you seek? They begin by addressing Jesus as rabbi or teacher. Incidentally, our, our earliest attestation to the term rabbi actually is in the New Testament. They think they're seeking where Jesus lives. Yet the reader has more knowledge. Although they ask, where do you stay, kumining, or where do you remain, the concept, or kumines, uh, kum, I should say, the concept of remain, or abide, mining, uh, is found throughout the Gospel and letters of John. Now, I don't want to allegorize, but in the light of the common use of mining, we must ask, does Jesus also remain among us, those who are called among his, by his name? In 8, 138 to 39, we also see the discipleship motif. Jesus' initial disciples followed Jesus and stayed till the fifth hour. They did not simply figure out where Jesus lived, they followed him. And when you see the term uh, akaluthai uh, 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 in the New Testament, the idea of uh, following is a discipleship term. That's why the story of uh, blind Bartimaeus, who follows Jesus in the road in Mark 10, is also a discipleship story. A healing becomes a discipleship. The fact that these people, that the first two follow Jesus, are shows that the um, their actions are related to becoming his disciples. There are ramifications of being with Jesus. Andrew finds his brother Simon. We have found the Messiah. Now, in the New Testament, the only place where the Hebrew term Messiah is used, transliterated, is in John. The NRSV often translates Christus as Messiah, but as a result loses the significance of the fact that Jesus is not described by that term except in John. Andrew takes him to Jesus, who renames him Cephas, Aramaic for rock, as Petros is the Greek term. The only other person who calls Jesus, uh, calls Peter Cephas, is Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and 15 and Galatians 1 and 2. Interesting that Paul, who also has strong Palestinian connection were called Peter Cephas. 
On the next day, there's the journey to Galilee. The calling of Philip is mentioned in 143. And in 144 to 51, there's the story of the call of Nathaniel, who is not mentioned as one of the 12 in the synoptics. Now, John never mentions the 12 as a group until 667, and they are not named. Nathaniel wonders if anything good could come out of Nazareth. The Messiah is supposed to come out of Jerusalem, after all, from Bethlehem. How could the Messiah be from the obscure town of uh, uh, of Nazareth. I have Bethlehem here. It should say Nazareth. Nazareth. Philip echoes Jesus' words when he says, Come and see. See 146 and 139. When Jesus meets Nathaniel, he's greeted as a sincere Israelite, one in whom there is no deceit or dollars. Nathaniel asks how Jesus could know him, and the response reveals Jesus' foreknowledge. He saw Nathaniel under a fig tree, a symbol of Israel. In the disciples, Israel is renewed. And this is followed by um, Nathaniel's confession in 149. You are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Son of God, incidentally, did not necessarily mean incarnation in uh, uh, the first century, since the king is the uh, uh, God's adopted son. But Jesus' response to Nathaniel is that he'll see greater things. Angels will be ascending and descending on the Son of Man as we see in Genesis 28, 12. This is the first time the phrase Son of Man is used in John. And Son of Man is Jesus' self-designation, favorite self-designation in the Synoptics. It's not prom as prominent in John, but then again is also used by Jesus as a self-designation. The imagery of angels ascending and descending comes directly from Jacob's ladder in Genesis 28, but also reflects the Merkaba of Ezekiel 1. The, the disciples are going to see uh, greater things, and that begins in John 2 with the wedding of Cana, and also in the cleansing of temple of the temple in 2, 12 to 21. At the wedding of Cana, that talks about the third day, there was a wedding, and Jesus' mother was there. Now, the fact that Jesus was a prominent uh, teacher is probably a reason he was invited. We cannot assume that Jesus is there because he was close friends of the wedding party. Rather, he, he was probably uh, invited as a, already as a prominent person in the, uh, um, uh, in the community. In verse 3, we see that the weddings gave out, the wine gave out. In Jewish weddings, they were, unlike the more informal marriage customs of the Greeks and Romans, were also joyful, not only um, um, ritualized, but were also joyous occasions, usually lasting about seven days. And it was expected there would be abundant food and drink, so much that uh, there would be food left over, where the wine to give out reflects a social crisis, certainly a social bah bah. Jesus' mother learned about the wine giving out. How she learned is not told. Women and men were usually separated in social settings. How does she have the ability to confront Jesus? Jesus' mother is never named, and Jesus' uh, 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 answer is abrupt. What to you and to me, or what do I have to do with you? His answer is harsh and hardly seems respectful. His reason is his hour is not yet come. Yet, Jesus' mother does not take no for an answer. Rather uh, than Jesus or the head waiter taking initiative, Jesus' mother, again, who's never named, takes charge. She tells the servants, to do whatever Jesus said. There are six stone jars. John notes that the jars are there for purification. Vessels for purification, as well as the mikvot, or the uh, ritual baths, were usually made of stone, since stone was not subject to ritual impurity. The miracle of the water to wine uh, follows typical format of miracle stories. There's the entry of the miracle worker, in this case Jesus, the problem is presented. They have no wine. The action is described, but the miracle itself is not narrated. Or the action is narrated, but the miracle itself is not described. The results of the miracle are given in 2, 9 to 11. The water is turned into wine. In fact, not only wine, but the very best of wine. And why has this been reserved to the end? 
And then there's a response. The disciples have seen Jesus' glory. This is a format you'll see in many miracle stories, if not most, if not all. So what is the meaning of this miracle story? Boltman and others saw this story as a reflection of the Dionysius tradition. Um, Thompson mentions this interpretation. But it fails to take into account the very Jewish setting and nature of the story. Rather, we have a sign of God's eschatological reign, a time of great abundance, as we see in 2 Barak 29.5-8 and in 1 Enoch 10.19. In the temple, in uh, 2.12-25, this is the first time in John Jesus journeys to temple for the feast. Here it, it is the Feast of the Passover. Um, I have tabernacle there. It should be. It is the feast of the of the uh, Passover. Jesus enters the temple and makes a whip of cords to drive out those who are selling. There's a different quote than that the temple has become a den of thieves, but rather it says, "You will not make my house, my father's a house, an emporium." And then in Psalm 69:10, "Zeal for your house consumes me." However, here it is, will consume it. It is a future. Why does John place the cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry? Some think this is when it actually occurred. Others say that there are two. Both of these explanations, I think, are very inadequate. Rather, we need to look at it for a literary purpose. It sets the stage for the reader to understand the purpose of Jesus' ministry. Rather than the three passion predictions we have in Mark, 831, 931, and 1032 and 33, we notice here that Jesus will tear down and rebuild the temple in three days. This temple, however, is uh, not the temple of Jerusalem, which has been in, under construction for 46 years and is not yet complete. It would not be finished until 66 CE. Rather, Jesus is redefining <coughs> the meaning of the term temple. It's not a physical building of stones. It is Jesus' own body. This will be remembered by the disciples after Jesus' glorification. Here we find that in John, glorification refers to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The disciples see this glory of the turning of the water into wine, but true understanding only occurs when Jesus is glorified, when he is raised from the dead. In John 2, 23 to 25, we find a summary statement. Many see Jesus' signs. The implication is there are more uh, signs than those narrated. But faith based on signs is inadequate, which we also see in the synoptic tradition. An adulterous, evil and adulterous generation seeks a sign. Signs must be observed with faith. It is the lack of faith that is demonstrated by the people as a whole. But... This will then lead to a discussion of what it means to inherit the kingdom of God and to have true faith in chapter 3. For next time, what is the significance that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night? What does the word anothen mean? What is the significance of the metaphor of the bridegroom in 327 to 30? How does the Samaritan understand living water? What does Jesus mean by salvation is from the Jews? And in 454, it says at the healing of the, uh, after the healing of the official son, this was the second sign Jesus performed uh, when he returned from Jerusalem to Galilee. What was the first sign? Thank you very much.